Welcome to an HR Technology edition of the Total Picture Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Clayton. Today, we're going to dive into our friend Ward Chrisman's favorite topic, the HR Alliances Collaboration Zone, with Ian Cook, who's the Vice President of People Analytics at Vizier. Ian participated in the HR Tech Alliances December Virtual Collaboration Zone event. And according to their LinkedIn profile, Vizier is, quote, the market leader in workforce analytics. Vizier is a cloud-based solution helping you see the truth in your data, unquote. Stuff like planning your future workforce, managing your recruiting pipeline, stemming high performer exit rates, measuring training productivity impact, measuring diversity goals, and more. Are these people clairvoyant? We'll dive into this in our conversation today. Ian, welcome to the Total Picture Podcast. Thank you very much for the introduction, Peter. It's nice to be here. So, so tell us uh, about your background and your roles and responsibilities at Vizier. Yeah, so my, my background is pretty varied. I've been an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial most of my life, running a learning event business. I've run uh, training uh, businesses a few times. And through that, I came into a consulting role where I spent a long time trying to help organizations really understand how to help people be at their best. And I was very careful how I phrased that. And then I ran into what I call the CFO problem. We'd be, we'd be have a, a you know an HR strategy program, some uh, practice that we knew was going to elevate people's experience of work, which would elevate the way work was done. The CFO would come show up and say, "Well, why why am I funding this, Ian? Like, why should I do this?" What, I get the idea, but I can't see the money. And I'm talking back in the you know, 80s, 90s, when people had a different view on, on human capital, as it were. So that pushed me personally to go like, how do I answer that question? And that drove me into the, the space of analytics. Like when you have data, when you can prove that decision X is better than decision Y, it's in the data, you have it substantiated, you've got some level of science behind it you change that conversation. So, so my career has really been about changing that conversation with the CFO. And then, and then for Vizier, um, I'm, the, I'm the person who guides the product. Uh, built, I've been there eight years, we're 10 years old. So I've kind of done every single job, including you know, making coffee, but um, some scrappy startup as we were. The, the, the primary contribution is about you know, the people analytics space, what are the questions? How are the practices evolving? Like, how do we actually help our customers overall? You know, really extend the effect they're having on their business. So, Vizier has really grown into being a, you know, one of the premier uh, people analytics platforms out there. Give us a little bit of a background on Vizier. You're based in Vancouver. Yeah, we 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 based in Vancouver. So, the background on, on Vizier is interesting. I, I think it's a story worth telling. Um, the founders of Vizier came from places like Crystal Decisions, Business Objects, SAP. Like the, the technologists and, and founders behind the company have 25 plus years in data warehousing, data integration, you know, BI technology. You know, think of your favorite early like 90s, early 2000s um, BI tool, and it's likely that one of our team worked on it. But when they came, what they when they came to visit, they're like, we're, we're not doing it wrong, but we're not doing it in a way that really helps the business. The technologists love it, IT love the tooling. It's kind of fun to play with. But when they went to ask the business, are you getting what you need? How are you getting things resolved? The business said, uh, it's okay, but every time I want to change, I have to ask IT. They don't quite understand my business question, so I'm not quite getting the information I need. So when Vizier was established, it was the was it start with the business question first. And that's uh, kind of guided everything we've done over the last 10 years. And, and we've grown because we solve all the different pieces of the puzzle. If, if you were to go and look at people analytics uh, today still, a lot of organizations will they'll work with a, an integration technology to build a data cloud or a, a data lake, sorry. They'll have different people pulling pieces of that data out and then stitching it to a Tableau or a Click or a Power BI to then distribute that. So they end up with this sprawling mess of people all hand hand making analytics products in lots of different places. And it, it struggles to scale. Either you're delivering lots of value, so you get lots of money, so you get lots of people, or you know you struggle to scale. Vizier has again, we've changed that whole dynamic where that um, consolidation, structuring, distribution of data is all done by a single technology. 
a bunch of it is automated. And that's what's driven our growth. We, we met the people who had struggled to scale and they said, oh, wow, I can really go farther faster with Vizier. Um, and that's, that's really been cornerstone of our success. Um, and the claim, on the, the claim on the website is actually substantiated by others. We're, we're repeating the, the work that's been, been done by folks like uh, GigaOM and Apps Around the World who looked at our penetration in the market. So um, it is, it's a claim that has data behind it because that's how we work at Vizier. So, so one of the uh, interesting aspects that you described in your presentation with HR Collaboration Zone um, was the company's focus on learning. And, and you said that learning is much more complex than other HR functions, such as talent acquisition to uh, track and analyze. So how so? Yeah, so and, and let me let me clarify that we, we've been in talent management and, and analyzing talent for a really long time. So we have a we have a robust, um, mature product there. We've been doing talent acquisition for a long time. We have a robust, mature product there. Hence the ISIMS um, partnership we were we'll talk about. And so learning was the new space for us. Learning is that that next frontier. Um, and learning data is complicated because it, it it's um it, it's a the challenge that HR has with lots of data in lots of places is kind of doubled or trebled inside learning. Uh, most customers that we have who are accessing our learning capabilities, they don't have a single content source. It's, it's not like everything lives in this single place. They'll have an LMS for tracking. They'll have four or five different content providers. The, uh, the world of social learning has opened up. So a lot of those content providers are, you know, free content on the web. It's, it's a YouTube video. It's a, document, it's a podcast, it's Coursera, it's Udemy. That, so actually, what are people consuming and where are they consuming it? Isn't a, it's not a single source problem. It's a multiplicity of sources. And then tracking all that back, it's, it's not enough to know that somebody did something. It's like, well, what was it and how long did they spend? And there's a, a real richness in the journey of learning that people go through. So first of all, tying all those different components of data together so you, you've got that clean record set and then looking at that journey over time. You know, none of the transactional systems are built to look at things over time. They're all look at, built to look at what's latest best. It's a, you, you're tracking a record, so you want to know what's current. So they're designed to track records. It's true for an HRS as well. Whereas when you actually wanna look at a learning journey, it's like, well, what, what did they, who did A and then when did they do B and then when did they do C? And where did they go from C? Did they go somewhere else? Um, so this notion that you're exploring and, and unlearning and growing your knowledge through a pathway, um, that means you have to structure the data and process the data certain ways. And, and that's, it's not something you can do in a spreadsheet. Like again, spreadsheets don't do over time. They do you know, this moment in time. Um, so that, that leads to the complexity, the, the range of data, and then the kinds of analytic processes you want to run, run on top of it. Yeah, I think this this whole uh, thing around learning is is fascinating right now because, as you know, Ian, uh, we're hearing a lot about the fact that that people need to upskill their talent, right? And yeah. also, you know, based on COVID and the pandemic, there is an awful lot of online learning that is taking place today, and people are now motivated more to. Uh, participate in a lot of these learning activities. So I think, you know, that kind of thing if, for companies to be able to track and analyze and understand what their employees are doing is really important. And it's hugely important. I, I think you make a really important point, Peter, that, that there was this general steady move towards um, less, less of the business kind of taking people by the hand through a learning path a more enabling individuals to find and pursue their own learning path. And it, we're going to go faster and better when there's an element of individual commitment to how learning is done. Um, but the, the pandemic has accelerated that. And then the technology has kind of flipped the problem. When, when you designed a learning path, like you put somebody in the front and they, they kind of went through it and you hope they were successful. Now individuals want to move faster. We can't manage paths for every individual. It's just too complex. So, but then you need to know who's who's actually consuming learning that's making a difference. Because you can go off and learn a bunch of stuff and then go somewhere else. Right. Is that good? You can learn a bunch of stuff and then you know that makes you ready for a different job or it makes you ready for promotion. And so so the, the 
the analytics of like who's really helping to grow their career what are the habits behaviors that we want to support uh, enable so that others do the same in align with where their business is going becomes a really important question and it, it, it's less of a command management approach and more of a enable and guide and understand and learn approach so that's where analytics plays a huge hugely important role you know, one of the takeaways for me for the December HR Alliance virtual collaboration event, since I, you know, I'm not a vendor, I'm not in, in steeped in all of this stuff all the time. It's just how much data is available out there for analysis. And, you know, your title is uh, Vice President of People Analytics. So, so take us there and give us a, yeah. a macro view of all this data that's available to uh, company leadership. Yeah, it's, it's, um, We've looked at the business questions, we track that back down to the data that's available, and then we build an analytic model that allows the questions to be answered. And, and you know, those are the three things that you need to do that funda foundationally to, to make it work. So, so we know about the data at Vizier because we, we have the, this really large kind of comprehensive data model that allows us to link talent acquisition data to exit data or learning events to um, sales and and the core of it is and it's again it's a reason why people need to be pursuing their uh, people on its capabilities the business questions you need to answer don't live in any single transactional system like for the longest time we will go out and talk to leaders and talent acquisitions like what do you want to know well i want to know which lead source if i hire from a lead source does that drive turnover Lots of people use LinkedIn. It's almost become the default place to, to go. But if I'm an employee on LinkedIn, I'm likely to be ambitious in growing my career. So if I hire from LinkedIn, does that person stay 18 months? Does that person stay two years? You know, that, that's a reference of a source that comes from my applicant tracking system. And it's an event that happens in my HRS system. Like I can't answer that question in either of those systems. So the Vizio world, and we've, we've designed our technology specifically to do this, is, is not to focus on the, keeping the transactions, it's to focus on using them. So we'll ingest data from a talent acquisition. We can bring in you know, survey data around that to what was the experience like. We can align that with the employee record, actually linking from when I'm pre-hire to post-hire. Everything we know about the employee, which is huge amounts, again, not, not just pay, but payroll, experience data from tools like Medallia, um, network analysis data from tools like Microsoft, uh, it becomes really quite complex. And that builds up a, a richness of data, allows you to understand, you know, if somebody joined from LinkedIn and built a network fast, did that keep them in the business? If somebody joined from LinkedIn, didn't really get a network established, did they leave the business? So to make it simpler, we break it into categories. There's a, there's a situation. It's like, how is this employee situated? Who do they work for? What's their role? Where do they work? Um, there's their sentiment. How do they feel about work? How do they feel about who they're working with? Uh, captured from lots of different uh, you know, in, engagement or experience-based tools. Their skills, which has been an emerging area. It's, a, it's an area we've invested a lot in developing our capabilities. Like skills would include, you know, what are they learning? What skills do they have? What skills does their job need? What skills are close to what they're doing? Um, and then was what we called social. We call it social because we need it to be NS. So, and social is sort of the network connection, the relationship connection inside the business. And so that starts to paint a, a, a relatively complete picture of the person. Uh, the different relationships and life cycles and connections they have in the business. We then attach that to, uh, we call it production because we want to, we want to productivity has got a really strange connotation as a word, but how many calls did I answer? How much revenue did I sell? How many um, you know cases did I process? And so you can see all these things together. And, um, and when you throw up, you know, when you throw up the slide, it gets a little daunting. There's like, there's, there's a whole category of technology under, learning a category of technology under talent acquisition. There's the core HRS systems. Um, there's, you know, the sales force to track somebody's record of sales. So it is a vast amount of data and often organizations kind of struggle to handle it all themselves. And again, that's, that's something that differentiates Vizier. We've thought about the process. We've built the model. We know how to get from the source data into our system so that you can just start answering the questions. We kind of take all of that 
how do I work with this stuff off your plate uh, and get people to the ability to work with it very, very fast. Right. Yeah. And, and for those uh, of uh, our listeners uh, watching this video version of the podcast, I'm going to share one of Ian's PowerPoint slides that shows just how widespread this has become as he was describing, you know, there's the learning and there, there's recruiting engagement and, and talent management and HRIS and payroll and time and attendance and, you know, the sales and productivity and the budget and costs from finance and all the HR tech companies that are aligned with all of these different metrics like, uh, you know, Workday and iSIMS and, and ADP. And, and so, so how do you connect <laughs> With the cornerstones and SAPs and Workdays and ADPs and Salesforce yeah, platforms, yeah. How, do, how does that all integrate within your busier platform? Yeah, and, and, and a, a fantastic question. And I actually want to start answering that in a slightly different place. Okay. Because one of the things that, that often gets overwhelming for people is like, my goodness, I've got all this data. I have to get it all in one place. Um, and that's not actually true. What, what, we espouse and what we work on is focus first on the question that you have to answer as a business. Like unlike an HIS where you tend to have to get all the processes right before you implement it. And so you've built all of your different workflows and then you go and build it. Analytics is an iterative cycle. So, you know, I just need to know my headcount and I just need to know my ins and outs, my starts and exits. Well, that's fine. That's in your HIS. Get that loaded up, start working with that then work out what your next question is. Oh, we've got big questions about compensation. Okay, tack that on. So an application like Vizier, it's not a one and done. You don't build it and leave it. You start with it and it just organically grows. And then on the, the data kind of integration side, we, we've, as I said, our founders, you know, ran data warehousing for SAP. So they, they've, they've seen all of the challenges, all of the uh, uh benefits and pitfalls of how you move data around. And so we actually built our own technology to consume and prepare data to load up into our engine. So that if for, for customers, it's actually really, really simple. There's a, a, a set of expected fields. We know what they are from each of these systems. We go through a, a descriptive process of here's, here's the file type, here's the fields. Uh, we've got tooling on our end where we can uh, adjust and alter things like dates or names. We, we do a lot of preparation, cleansing on the data before it comes into us. So for customers, it's actually relatively straightforward. It, it's a push of um, you know a snapshot in time or a series of events uh, into Vizier's environment. So we get uh, typically what we've been running for you know six to twelve months with a customer. They'll have automated a feed of you know, five to six from five to six different systems, just being push to Vizier on uh, whatever cadence they want, be it daily, weekly, or monthly. So it, so it, it actually is, it sounds really complicated and like we're going to spend forever actually building all of these connections and uh, our methodology removes all that. We, we recently stood up, stood up a large German banking client um, to do three years of history, everything about their demographics, everything about their compensation so they could be ready to plan. And it took us six weeks. Wow. So so the people's expectations on all this data and what technology can do, they need to just check them um, because it, it's not our way it works differently and it doesn't have the kind of challenges and, and bottlenecks that people are used to having in trying to write those tight connections. So it's quite, it is quite revolutionary and people are like, oh, I don't believe it. I, you know, data is always a mess. <laughs> um, so we have a number of proof points of that kind of delivery. And it seems to me now that we are all in this new world of, you know, working remotely that all of this analytics data that you're able to present to your clients is even more powerful and important because everyone is working from home. Hugely. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we've seen, <clears throat> excuse me, within our customer base is the data getting pulled further and further out into the business. Like most people are like, it starts with the CHRO or the executive rolls out to HR leadership, potentially gets engaged with HR business partners, depending on the business. We've seen it now going down to people managers where 
there's a even more recognition by the business that a people manager, you just don't quite get the same feel through a Zoom call as you do, um, you know, walking around the floor. You, you you don't have that. I don't even know how to describe the sense it is that you have evolved as a manager and like where are my people at. So that that means the data is even more essential and actually helping answer that. So we've seen lots of our clients actually pushing even further out to, to give people managers access to information about their teams. And, and a lot of it is, is in the, um, the survey of, you know, work from home experience, the survey of uh, just the fatigue that is building up for all of us um, through this COVID phase. So a lot of, there's a lot more use of listening to the employee, really trying to understand their situation, really trying to help managers make sure they have the right conversation with those people. Um, so I think that's a, a strong piece. Not, not a fan of all of the t apps that have started to count time and count keystrokes and work out how long you were looking at your computer for. I, um, I think there's been a, a valid and really strong backlash against those. Yeah, I, the, I, the big brother stuff is a little, yeah. I, I don't know if you saw what, uh, yeah, anyway, I'll, I'll, I, there's been a number of those things, you know, we'll, we'll take a snapshot from the, the, the laptop camera ev randomly every half an hour. Um, we are not supporters of that kind of surveillance type uh, analytics, but things where you can listen to an employee sentiment, you can uh, distribute that so that lots of people can have the right conversations. You know, that's the kind of um, commitment and approach to people that we know pays dividends. So you know, that's we've seen that in a number of our clients working that way. Yeah, I, and I think that's a really important clarification that you just made. You know, it's it's not not surveillance. Right. Yeah. And, and, and people on Alex sometimes gets painted with that. Oh, you know, the, the machine's going to make a decision about my future. I don't like that. And it's like, that, again, that's that's not our approach. It's not the approach of the clients we're working with. They're, they really are in looking to understand dynamics in the business that they can enable people to thrive. Because when they, they people know when, when employees thrive, the business thrives like that's it's a win win. So um, right. I think it's important to to uh, just clarify that point of view. So you you brought up uh, ISIMS earlier in our conversation. And so th there, there was part two of your collaboration zone presentation that involved Vizier's new partnership with ISIMS that was um, announced at ISIMS inaugural Inspire virtual conference last yeah. month. So, so tell us about your partnership with ISIMS and, and the benefits from doing so. Yes, no, super excited about this. I think, and I think this is the it kind of goes to the, your your conversation about there's lots of systems and there's like how does this all work and like the the confusion for the consumer is potential to be really high and, and I think a number of vendors ISIMS being one um, a strong relationship with, with Vizier recognize that you know that there's there's no one system can do it all you you can get a lot from a lot of different places but this notion that everything you ever need to manage your people will come from one place is kind of going away. I think there's a recognition that's not the case. So our partnership with, with ISIMS is, is sort of the, the reality of that state in the market. And it's us as vendors working to make sure that the customer doesn't have to solve how, for, how we work together. It's us solving together how we work together. And there's a the complement the complementarity piece the pieces where we complement each other that's a better way to say it are you know ISIMS has a really rich um, evolving and powerful set of capabilities around uh, ATS uh, talent management um, and they can do good reporting on you know what's my current state what moved you know they they've got the insight to understand what's happening at a certain point in time. But there's a whole other set of questions around what's happening over time. It's this um, complementarity of systems where a, a transactional system keeps the now and helps you work on the now and understands what's happening now. An analytics system keeps history and, and structures history so that you can answer questions of it in real time. And so that's that's why we're putting the two pieces together. There's lots of organizations would be pulling data from ISIMS to run, you know, which of our requisitions move fastest? What's the, the, the diversity makeup around our various different requisitions? Like, are we getting a lot of uh, diversity data? Are people actually checking that box for us? Are they not? Like, there's just a lot of more um, complex questions that people are looking to ask answer off their ATS data. And, and that's what we support 
items to do. And again, by going in partnership, we look at each other's data structures, we look at how each other works, we understand how data comes across. So if somebody, I mean, we actually have several customers in common already, which is again, kind of starts to build the basis for that partnership. But somebody says, oh, I'm, you know, I'm an ISIMS customer. How do I get my analytics? They, they've got the choice, they, they can build it themselves. Or again, there's Vizier, which is, yeah, we know it, we know how it works. We've done 25 of them. We, we're shaping our technology to really make the most of the ISIMS data. And so we become that, we become players in ecosystem. And we see the ecosystem, um, you know, we see the COVID accelerated the ecosystem because because the number of different pieces of technology, uh, and uh, you know, very excited where we can go. Lots of excitement. I mean, we announced it at Inspire, and again, the the excitement from the Isom's customer base, and again, our customer base that's got Isom's has been really tangible. So we know we're onto something where it's vendors working together to solve the customer problem, knowing that it lives in both systems is. Uh, something we're you know continuing to support, continue to grow with something that's got um, a lot of support from from the customer base, to be honest. So, so that's the, that's the foundation of it. Hopefully, that's a good explanation. Yeah, and and you know, I I think you're absolutely right because one of the complaints I hear from HR leaders uh, often is, you know, there are just too many different platforms and tools that they need to log into to do their jobs, and that the applications don't connect with one another's online tools. Um, so I think, you know, that kind of initiative that what you're doing with ISIMS and, you know, and, and other vendors to bring your, your tools together so that uh, they're unified and, and your clients can go to one place and really do the analysis they need to do is, is terrific. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's actually a big part of our, um, it's part of our current offering. We, we have a technology that we have a part of our technology where we, we offer um, embedded analytics. So Paycor and Insperity basically run analytics in their product from Vizier. We're like, you know, like the Intel inside or powered by. So the, both of those organizations are, their analytics is powered by Vizier. And we continue to ex, sort of expand our capabilities in that place. So it's not that everybody's coming to Vizier. You, you may be coming to ISIMS and accessing analytics about a different applicant journeys or the history of this requisition uh, in ISIMS, but powered by Vizier. Because the, the, the truth is, and it's again, it's something that, that the, the um, uh, customers don't need to understand, but the truth is that you can't do analytics on a transactional system. You have to move the data, prepare it and use it a different way. It's very much that you know column versus uh, row type picture. And so you're always going to need these different technologies working together. Uh, I think the vendors, and again, we're very excited to be partnering with people like Isom's Medallia, uh, Fuel50, MZ as well. We've got a, a partnership um, in place so that we're, we're solving that problem in a way that really does meet market need and, and taking, all of the, taking all of that, how does this work stuff um, off of the customer to try and solve and making it about our collaboration. Yes, yeah, so, so um, I just want to shift gears a little bit because uh, there was something you posted on LinkedIn that I really found interesting, and that is, quote, overall, our customers have increased the representation of women in leadership by 11.5% and the improved retention by 70%. And we yep. expect this positive momentum to continue as more yep. people follow the path built by our leading customers. So... Ian, that's really cool. And so how is this accomplished? <laughs> um, so, so Vizier is a catalyst in this change. Uh, we, we've had, again, we've been in the analytics space for eight years. We've had diversity data in for all of those eight years. Literally, one of the first things I did when I joined Vizier was pipe the EEOC data as a benchmark into Vizier so Vizier's customers could look at the different categorizations of role and understand if their their female ratio or minority ratio was was on or off the national average for their state. So we've been you know exploring and helping customers uh, work on diversity for a really long time. And what we what we noticed so two things we actually have rights aggregate, aggregate rights to all of our customer data, so we can look at our entire customer data set, ten million and plus records, and understand patterns in that data. And, and that's where these numbers come from. We looked at. You know, before somebody joined Vizier, after they joined Vizier, how has 
the representation of women in leadership changed. And on a macro level, we've it's increased in, in our in the customers once they become busier customers. How it works is two things. Uh, again, and this this really comes from customers, and it's it's more about our customers' competence than our data. But it, the data without the data, it doesn't happen. Um, they analyze, and they can analyze not just the big bucket, like are we you know forty percent female on average? It's like where are we forty percent female? And by being able to actually display that to executives to talk it through with the organization, say sure our female ratio looks okay, but it looks okay because everybody's at the bottom. That's not okay. That's not serving our business the way we need it to. And so it's, you know, it's people inside businesses being ready to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if I go back to my early, early state, it's about actually then having the data to say, look, this is the case. I'm not making it up. I'm not thinking it's bad. It's not anecdotal for me wandering around the office. It's substantive and true in the data. So you build the data, you build the credibility, and then I, I know a lot of our clients, it's, it's been very important for them. So they just haven't given up on the conversation. Um, and that's led to change. It's led to uh, more and more people thinking about the decision when they choose to promote somebody or they choose to hire a manager. And, and it, you start to do that across lot, hundreds of businesses and thousands of people, you actually start to move the needle. So again, we I don't know that we've made enough fuss about it, but Busy is very proud of our the, the role that we have played in actually uh, moving the needle. And I, I it's fascinating for me because when I go and talk to a bunch of our customers, they're like, yeah, yeah, we know we've made progress, Ian, but it's not enough. So that was that was the sort of the second piece. My, my feel is we've, we've actually built this capability to use data to drive this important agenda. We've got organizations showing how they can do it and that it works. And that also those organizations are hungry for more. Um, so that's the that's why I see it increasing. Um, so that's the background to that story. It, it, again, it's driven by research into our data. It's that combination of access to insight that's credible and trusted, and the willingness to have the conversation that lead to changes in practice that have you know, again made a substantial move. Because we're well, 10 million employees. It's it's not exactly the whole of the U.S., but it's a very large population. Yeah, and I, and again, I think that's really encouraging, and the fact that your customers are willing to look at this data and then do things to plan on increasing the number of women in leadership roles within their organizations. And, I mean, I'll, I'll, if, if for time, I'll share just one other quick story because sure. re recent recent conversations with five, five or six organizations that they've, they've looked at the question of women, but they're also looking at people, looking at um, underrepresented groups. And what they were all able to analyze again is this, the, the, the pathways up through the organization weren't there. So it really rolls back into this whole economic opportunity, um, making the organizational system really open to everybody. And, and it, so the, the even more movement in terms of going to the executives and saying, we need to work out how we get learning opportunities in front of everybody, like frontline, like the whole notion, I think it's McDonald's has the notion that, you know, the, C the next CEO is somebody who is flipping burgers. And so a lot of them are starting to adopt that mindset. It's like anybody who comes into our business should have access to an opportunity to grow their career such that they could be a CEO of our business. And you know, hearing that from four or five different customers and knowing that that's got commitment from the executive, I see that changing. And that's come from this very, very constant presentation of like, you know, we're diverse, but we're diverse here. We're diverse, we're diverse here. We're not seeing it grow up. So again, very optimistic about help being part of like driving improvements in the, in the future. Interesting. So, so uh, Ian, something else I found on your LinkedIn profile is called the Thursday debate. Yes. Um, and here, here is a recent one. Should the people analytics function be one, an operational function focused on building products which improve day-to-day -day people decision across the business, or two, a research function which does projects to understand why, how pe or why or how people are impacting specific business processes or outcomes. And, and I love this question because it gets beyond just crunching numbers because we can, which I, you know, a lot of, a lot of this stuff, let's face it, is the gee whiz aspect is, wow, we can do this, really? We can see this? 
to 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 you know something that really puts it into the why why are we doing this so so what did the LinkedIn community think? It was it was brilliant, and I I mean I'm I'm sort of purposive in how I present these. I I don't, and rather than lots of people are making statements on LinkedIn. That's that's uh, one way of uh, building profile. The the practice of people analytics is, is evolving, and there's lots of m- sort of myths and misassumptions. So I'm trying to create very two different options. The answer is always somewhere in the middle. The 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 community came back with it the the first it, the 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 core of it is actually to build data products that serve a business leader to make the, the business better and that that you know the that the foundation you, to think about how am i building out a people analytics function you're not chasing some single truth about people first you're actually getting some really substantive clear sometimes even very simple pieces of data out to HR or out to people managers in a way that as a as a consumer they consume the data. Um, one of our one of our repeat customers has actually gone through a whole product cycle as they've launched People Analytics. They went to a stakeholder group. What's the data? What's your workflow? How would you use it? How would you like to see it? This is the product. Do you like it? What should we change? Like they went through three iterations before they kind of locked in this analytics product. Very very successful. I think it's a, a leading practice that will take hold. I'm super impressed. But two or three years ago, everything that was featured in the panel, People Alex conversation was about, you know, who's got the best algorithm for this? Who's discovered what net new interesting aspect about human performance that we could use? And, and there's the balance of the debate was actually that's important, but it's not, it's only important in that it feeds the building of a product. It's only important in that it feeds an outcome for the business. Because that wave two or three years ago, there were lots of, um, teams, you know, thrown up to do, let's do people analytics. And and they went chasing some really interesting, but very academic uh, sort of research projects inside the business. Um, And often they didn't connect up to what the business needed. And so of of course, when, when the, the balance sheet is done is like, well, what did we spend and what did we get? It's like, well, we spent this and we, we kind of got something that actually should show up in an academic paper, not something (laughs) that, not something that is driving my revenue. And, and so, you know, I wanted to really, really highlight, and that, that came back again from the, the practitioners. It's like, yes, you have to do research, but you have to, A, get permission for it. You have to frame it in a way we're doing this research because if it's true, the upside is huge. Knowing it's not true is also relevant and we can't find the research somewhere else. Like everybody loves to do research, but why do, why do research when somebody else has done it? Is, is kind of my right. business perspective. So I really wanted to kind of convey that um, people's misapprehensions a lot about people and like says, you know, you've got to go and chase some golden AI algorithm that, you know, butters your toast and answers every question. And that really is not the work that's to be done. It really is far more pragmatic, uh, far more uh, focused on the business uh, and, and far more at scale, which again is, is what came back from um, the practitioner set that, that I talked to. So it, it's been a ton of fun. Uh, I think it's, generated a lot of interest and I will, I'm aiming to keep it going. So good. That's great. Yeah. You know, to the point of like the, the G whiz aspect of the stuff, because there certainly is that, and you can create these beautiful graphs and charts and, and then you go, well, yeah, that's cool. But what are we going to do with all this information? You know, <laughs> and, and well, there's that. And then there's a couple of pretty classic, um, extremely expensive um, kind of, misses in my mind um one is uh, it's publicized so i can share it as a while back and i think it was a, a good learning experience but google t- the google team built an algorithm to decide who should get promoted um, and they you know so they went through the whole like who's been successful at being promoted what was the data we had about them how do we use that data and so they came up with a factor and they said well if we apply this factor to all the people who are eligible to be promoted we'll know who should be promoted what they forgot is that people are human, that there's a relationship aspect to this. And so managers flatly refused to have that decision made by a machine. And so I, you know, I think it's a worthwhile experiment to understand, can we drill this decision down to a, a number? Literally, it was a, a number. Um, but the upshot of that was, 
in the it, it didn't serve the needs of the audience it was supposed to help so um needless to say i'm pretty sure they're making promotion decisions in the you know informed by data but in the, the more um data and judgment kind of approach which i think is appropriate so uh, a number of those stories from from the history yeah. of how this field has grown that i think are in, instructive and if i was a you know a senior executive looking to build out a people analytics practice i would want to understand where to focus my resources to get success quickly and again that's a big part of what we're trying to do so yeah and i really appreciate our time today and uh you know what what haven't we discussed that you think is important for people to know about vizier so uh, when i think one thing that's important to know about vizier is just the the scale at which we solve the problem and that we're we're often we're just seen as a front end like we have a very beautiful ui and so people go oh vizier that's like a visualization tool what is often misunderstood is like with a visualization tool we are the data layer with the data model where the whole set of standards and metrics on hr which are proven tested like we know they work we know they work together uh, and we're also then the kind of hands and hearts to get the data from a to b so all that data preparation work. So, uh, you know, you look at Vizio and go, yeah, that's like a such and such visualization, but there's so much underneath. And because we built it hand in glove, we built it ourselves, it's run by our people. The speed to value is very different from what any other uh, process could, could do. So um, because it's distinctive, IT are often like, no, that's not, it's not done that way. And then they find out that it is how we, what we've done, they go, oh, that's amazing. So just giving yourself the permission to educate um, on the technology, on what's possible. And the fact that HR can stay in control of the people on Lick's journey, it's not an IT project, it's it's an HR project that should be led that way. Great. Well, um, again, thank you so much for taking time to speak with us today here on, on the Total Picture podcast. How can our audience connect with you and learn more about Vizier? Yeah, so LinkedIn, I'm a, an active on LinkedIn. I love to connect with people, uh, love the debate. Um, and then vizier.com, a, a whole set of resources around what we do, how we do it, uh, white papers on the, the, the output. You know, a lot of people are looking for like, does people analytics make a difference? We've been at it 10 years. We've built it for a lot of enterprise customers. We have a slew of, of case studies on, you know, the kinds of results, the tangible, uh, measurable financial results that come about from this work. So please, please avail yourselves of those if it helps you to, to move your mission forward. Great. Thanks again, Ian. You're welcome, Peter. Nice to talk to you. Hey, it's Peter Clayton. Please hang on for just a minute. Like most of you, my business was completely upended by COVID-19. Instead of filming marketing, sales, testimonial, and product demo videos at conferences and corporate offices, I'm living on Zoom. Zoom can be an effective video tool for many kinds of powerful content. As people have become more comfortable being on camera and upgrading their video streaming capabilities, we are now able to create high quality, entertaining, and informative videos using the Zoom platform. Virtual meetings, customer testimonials, product demos, marketing pitches. You'll be amazed at the video quality and the amount of sophistication and graphic complexity we're able to create. For a free consultation on how you can use video to market and promote your business, send me an email, peter at totalpicture.com and check out totalpicture.com forward slash work. I look forward to hearing from you, and thanks for tuning in.